Oh, you look better now. <laughs> Excuse me. How's everybody doing? You doing all right? Good. We got uh, some excited people over here. Got a little pocket of excitement going on right here. I, I, I don't know. What, I don't know. Lord, Lord bless you. Keep you. You know. No, I'm, 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 I'm really glad everybody's here today. I know I kind of say that uh, most Sundays, uh, that I'm excited, because I am excited. To me, Sunday is the most exciting day of the week, and sometimes it takes us a while to get here. Sometimes it takes some twists and some turns and some extra work and some late nights, but I'm always just excited for all of you to be here and for us all to be together so we can sing together and pray together and fellowship together and to gather around the truth of God's Word. It just, it just doesn't get a whole lot better than that. And so I'm excited. I'm also excited that we are beginning this, uh, this new sermon series. And it's called Reset. Reset. Because uh, we're, we're heading into, we talked about this last week, we're heading into this season, right? This, uh, this fall season. It doesn't feel like fall yet. But it's, it's right around the corner. It's coming. But in another way, it does feel like fall because we're all getting back into our routines, right? We're all getting back into school. And, uh, you know, before school, after school, we're getting back to our regular, you know, Friday night routine. The whole thing. We got football. We got choir concerts. We got band competitions. We got uh, cheerleading. We got, you know, uh, all, all of the things that come with fall. And then before we know it, it's going to be Halloween. And before we know it, it's going to be Thanksgiving. And we're going to wake up one morning and it'll be almost Christmas. How many of you are heading into this season and you're already exhausted? Anybody? Yeah, you, just be honest. It's okay. It's okay. And I was thinking about this, this series, this whole concept, and, and uh, I thought about it this way. How many of you have ever had computer issues? <laughs> Technology makes your life easier, right? Just keep repeating that to yourself. You'll believe it. This is what happens, right? You're, you know, you're, you're working away, maybe crafting this powerful email or working on a document or a spreadsheet or something, and all of a sudden you just know, you can see it, it happens. Your, your computer's running slow. It's getting bogged down. You're cruising around on the internet and the pages just don't load properly. It's just getting bogged down. And, 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 and so you, you try to take some action, uh, but before you can take some action, all of a sudden, what do you see? You see the dreaded spinning rainbow disc of death. Oh, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, yeah, it's just, it just sits up there laughing at you, spinning in all of its colors. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes you just, you know, you just shut it down and you restart it. It boots back up again. Everything's okay. Sometimes you shut it down and then you start it back up again and it tells you you need some updates. Sometimes it yells at you. You haven't updated this thing in about three years. And so he said, okay, I'll do the updates. And you hit the update button, and then about 20 minutes later, you're at 3%. And then you're at 19%. It seems like it takes forever. But after those updates are complete, what happens? Your computer is now running faster and more efficiently. It's working better than it did before the updates. It's great. But then there are those times when you see the dreaded spinning rainbow disc of death and you start hitting every button on the keyboard and you start, you know, praying and doing incantations and, and, it, and nothing works. It just, it's just frozen. It's just immobilized. So, you know, if you're at work, you call your IT person. If I'm here, I usually call Jay because Jay helps me out and things like that. And sometimes they can come and they can, they can do that magic voodoo computer stuff that they do. You know, they get in behind the scenes and where there are all the, the numbers and shapes and squiggles and you don't know what that is. Sometimes they can just, just work their magic and, and they'll pull you out. They'll dig you out of it. But then there's that time. You know, they look at you with this sad, pitiful look on their face and they give you the pronouncement, much like a doctor would give a bad diagnosis. They say, no, there's nothing we can do. It's going to take a whole reboot. And you hear these dreaded words, restore factory default settings. And that's the worst news in the world because 
when it, when it ever does get running again, you don't have any idea what's going to be in there. It's a complete meltdown. It's a complete waste. Maybe your documents will be there. Maybe they won't be there. Your, your history's all gone. Half your apps are gone. Restore factory defaults is like the worst thing that could possibly happen. And that's the way it is in our lives sometimes. We're heading into this busy, chaotic season. Are you running slow? Are you getting a little bogged down? Overwhelmed? It may be that you just need a little restart. You know, maybe a couple of good nights sleep, maybe schedule a spa day, many petty, something like that. Or maybe you need some updates. Maybe, maybe you need some, some extended downtime. Maybe you need some self-care. When you come back, you'll work better and more efficiently and more energetically than you did before. Whatever the case may be, your doctor will tell you, your therapist will tell you, you better slow down before you melt down before you hear those words, restore factory default settings, right? Reset before you have to reboot. And that's the way it, it happens in our lives spiritually as well. Anybody ever felt bogged down spiritually? Maybe you're going through a dry spell. Maybe, you, maybe you're, you're running slow. Maybe you lost your fire, lost your passion. You get caught up in all the minutiae, all the routines and the programs and the petty little conflicts and issues. You get, you get stalled out. How about this? Have you ever prayed and all you see when you pray is the dreaded spinning rainbow disc of death? Yeah, me too. It's a sign. We need to refocus we need to recalibrate in order to launch ourselves into this next season. We might need some, some spiritual updates, some fresh wind, some fresh fire, some new revelations, some passion. We need to reset before we have to reboot. And that's what the book of Ephesians is all about. The book of Ephesians is a small book. It's only six chapters, but it is dense. There is so much packed into the book of Ephesians that we could do a two-year series on it. We won't. But the book of Ephesians is a letter. It's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. And we assume because it has the word Ephesians in it that it was written to one church, the church at Ephesus. But we know from close examination that that's not entirely true. See, there was a group of churches in Asia Minor, what we now know as Turkey, Certainly Ephesus was a part of this group. In fact, they were the hub church, the mother church. But there was a group of them. We'll hear about them 30 years later in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches. This is, this is what this letter was written to. And we know this was written to the group of churches because in every other letter where Paul is writing to a single church, he, he knows these people. He spent three years in Ephesus. And so he starts mentioning people by name. Hey, don't, don't forget about so-and-so and, and check up on so-and-so who's sick and, and, and thanks be to God for so-and-so who helped me out and, and who gave an offering. And he mentions all these people. He doesn't mention any, any person by name in the book of Ephesians. And so the story is that Paul planted the church in Ephesus, but then he started planting all of these satellite churches in the area, in the region. And these churches I mean, they took off like wildfire. They, they, they sprung up quickly. They quickly caught fire. They were alive and thriving. But these churches were almost exclusively Gentile churches. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so they're, they're alive and they're thriving. But over time, many of the Jews in the region began to come to faith in Christ, which is awesome. They believed that, that Jesus is the promised Messiah that fulfilled all the prophecies of their scripture. But when these Jews and these Gentiles started to come together and, and they started operating in the same churches, they caused some issues. Because the Jews has, had a very different idea about faith. They believed that, that, that Christianity, belief in Jesus as Messiah, was inherently Jewish. Ah, they let these Gentiles in on it. They had to. You know, they previously referred to Gentiles as dogs. Definitely second class. And so these Jews kind of came in with some unhealthy ownership. It's like, no, you, in order to be Christian, you have to still keep the law. You still have to keep all of the dietary restrictions and the feasts and the festivals. You have to do your, your temple worship and keep your Sabbath, get circumcised. Gentiles were not crazy about that one. And so this caused some division. It caused some struggles, some issues. 
Not to mention that they, they were all churches that were operating in an insanely, intensely pagan culture. So you got all of this mixing and matching with the worldly culture and the spiritual culture and the law of the Jews and the Torah and everything, and it left them wide open to false teachers and to conflicts and to discouragement. They were bogged down. They were running slow. And so Paul hears about this, and he, and he fires off this letter to encourage them. It's like, guys, don't crash and burn. Don't give up. Don't walk away. Just reset, refocus, recalibrate. Take your eyes off of your petty differences. Take your eyes off the things of this world, the minutia of this world, and, and, and put your eyes on the things that really matter. You need a reset. And that's exactly the message that Paul is going to speak to us. And so as we work our way through the book of Ephesians, we're not going to go verse by verse, detail by detail. We're going to go chapter by chapter. There are six chapters. There will be six messages in this series. And so we're not going to dig down deep into the details. We'll do that in a Bible study or something later on. But we're going to take one chapter at a time. So we're going to start with chapter 1. And what we're going to do each week is we're going to read the entire chapter. So if you've got your device, if you've got your Bible, just open it up to Ephesians 1, and I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to start to unpack it. Here's what it says. Ephesians 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, I hope you're catching this theme, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him... You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We made it. And you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. Paul, how about some punctuation in there? (laughs) That's what he has to say to us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. And we thank you for this letter, this scripture. Lord, I pray that you would breathe life into us today. And Lord, help us reset so that we can keep our eyes focused on you and the calling you have for us. 
rather than the calling the world might have for us. Open our minds, open our souls and our spirits and pour your truth down deep. Lord, bless us and anoint us in this time we have together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul is writing this letter partially because these Christians have a lot of questions. And they're not unique questions. They're the same questions that you and I have. Questions like, why am I here? What is my purpose? What am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? What do we do in the face of adversity? All those questions. And Paul is going to address every one of those questions as we work our way through this letter. But here in this first chapter, it's as if Paul is saying, before we get to all those other questions, we have to answer the most important question first. And the most important question in Paul's mind is, who am I? Who am I? What is my identity? And that's a loaded question. It was for them, and it's a loaded question in our world today because everybody, it seems, is confused about who they are. And the world says, well, if you don't know your identity, just make one up. Just choose one. What's the biggest catchphrase we have? I identify as, right? Paul says, no, it it doesn't work that way. You don't get to self-identify. These categories no longer apply. You, You don't get to identify yourself by your occupation or by your political party or by your denomination, or even by your sexual preference. None of those labels define you. They might be a part of who you are. It might be part of the pool that you swim in, but they are not you. It doesn't define you. If you're going to reset your life, reset your perspective, reset your family and your calling and your passion, the first thing you must do is reset your identity. Who are you? Paul says, discover who you really are. And he tells us who we are in two words. In him. In him. In whom? In Christ. In Christ. This this phrase is so important. I know you caught this while we were reading. He uses that phrase, those two words, 13 times just in one chapter. So you're not Methodist, you're not Baptist, you're in him. You're not Republican or Democrat. You are in Him. You're not young. You're not old. You're in Him. You're not black or white or brown. You're in Him. You're not a farmer or a nurse or a teacher or a banker. You are in Him, in Christ. In fact, Paul will say in another letter to the Galatians, he'll say, there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor even male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Those things may be a part of your life, part of your existence, but they don't define you. Your true identity is in Christ. And Paul says if you're going to wrap your mind around it, if you're going to wrap your heart around it, you're never going to live the same way again. But then you say, okay, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. In Christ, you get a new operating system. You you walk out into a a whole new world. And we think about this and we think, oh yeah, well, when I get saved, Christ is in me. But did you know that you are also in Christ? That you operate in Christ's world. That you have access to all Christ has. It's a new life. It's a unique life. It's not a life that you could create for yourself. It's a life that Christ gives to you when you are in Christ. It is your true identity. And Paul, in this chapter, is going to paint a picture for us. He's going to explain exactly what it looks like to be in Christ. He's going to give us five pieces of the puzzle that when we put them all together, we will discover who we really are in Christ. And here's the first piece of the puzzle. In Christ, you are uniquely blessed. Uniquely blessed. Look at verse 3. 
He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Bless, three times in one verse. How many blessings are we blessed with? Every. Every blessing. What kind of blessings are they? Spiritual blessings. Every spiritual blessing. Where are these spiritual blessings? They're in the heavens, the heavenly places. You see, what's happening here is when you are in Christ, you not only live and move and operate on the earth, but you live and move and operate in the heavens, in the heavenly places. Paul will say in Philippians, he'll say, their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now, we hear that verse, and we quote that verse, and we think, oh, yeah, my citizenship is in heaven. I'm just an alien and a stranger here on this earth. I'm just passing through. It's not my home. Someday I'm going to be a citizen in heaven. No, you are a citizen of heaven right now. You have dual citizenship. Part of you lives here, and part of you lives in the heavens. You have access right now to everything, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The world is down here grubbing around for worldly blessings. The world is here grubbing around for health and wealth and status and success. But you have every spiritual blessing. You have a constant flow of grace and mercy and love and peace and the power of an eternal God. It's kind of like a deep sea diver. You know, deep sea divers, they go way down to the ocean floor. And they operate down there. But they have this airline that goes all the way up to the surface. Yeah, they're operating down here, but their life comes from the surface. It comes from up there. That's what you have when you are in Christ. You have a new life, and you have a blessing line to the heavens. You operate down here, but your life comes from up there. And it's not just how you operate. It's who you are. It's your true identity. You are uniquely blessed. But Paul's just getting started. He says you're uniquely blessed, but he also says that you are uniquely chosen. Verse 4 says, just as he, the Father, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. What does this mean? It means that you're not an accident, that you're not a coincidence, you're not random. You are chosen. Chosen. Who chose you? God the Father chose you. In him, in Christ. When did he choose you? He didn't choose you when you finally got qualified. He didn't choose you when you finally got your act together. No, he, he chose you, it says, before he created the universe. He knew about you before anybody knew about you. He cared about you before your mama cared about you, before your grandmama cared about you. He loved you when you didn't even know what it meant to, to love yourself. Psalm 139 says, he knit you together in your mother's womb. And I can just imagine God just putting you together. You know, it's like, yeah, I got this part. Yeah, I got that part. Oh, this is a good special part. He's, he's making a masterpiece. He's crafting a work of art. He says, yes, I chose this one right here. Why did he choose you? So you could be holy and blameless. He said, oh, I'm out then. <laughs> and I'm not holy, and I certainly am not blameless. But that's not what these words are getting at. It's not what Paul's saying. This word holy means different, set apart, purpose. It means to, to be right with God, to be in relationship with the Father. He, he chose you for that. But then he also chose you to be blameless. And that doesn't mean that you never do anything wrong. No, what blameless means is without accusation. Who is the accuser? It's Satan. It's the devil himself. And so you, you were chosen from before the universe began to be in a relationship, to belong to God, and to be protected by heaven. God designed you and chose you to belong to him. And then it says in verse 5 that he predestined you. What does that mean? It means that he determined your destination in advance. He gave you a direction in advance. What is the destination that God has planned for you? He says it right there. Adoption as sons. He destined you to be adopted as sons. And this is not a biological term. It is a positional term. So ladies, you are sons. 
Guys, you are sons. It, it, means, it means firstborn, heir to the promise, different, special. You've been adopted as sons. I know all about adoption. I have four children, and my oldest two I adopted. It was, it was one of the best days of my life. But you know what the coolest thing is about adoption? I did not know this until I adopted my children. Do you know whose name is now on their birth certificates? Mine. Because they belong to me. I raised them. I cared for them. They're mine. I'm here to tell you today that God's name is on your birth certificate. He chose you. He created you. And then he adopted you. You have a home that you couldn't have got by yourself. You have a life you could have never lived on your own. You have purpose and meaning and hope that you never would have had. You're going somewhere. You've got direction and purpose. You didn't just randomly pop out of the womb. God didn't just, just create you and then release you out into the wild and say, go fend for yourself. No, he designed you on purpose. He crafted you on purpose. His signature is on you and his fingerprints are all over your life. That's who you are. That's your true identity. You are uniquely blessed and you are uniquely chosen. But then he gets to the meat of the matter. In piece number three, you're uniquely blessed, uniquely chosen, and you are uniquely redeemed. Uniquely redeemed. Verse seven says, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. In him, in whom, in Christ, in Jesus. Because God knows, God knew that we were going to walk away from our choosing, that we were going to walk away and forfeit our adoption. But when we walked away and when we found ourselves lost, who came and got us? It was Jesus. What did Jesus do for us while we were still lost? He redeemed us. How did he redeem us? Through his blood, through his death and his resurrection. What did he give us through his death and resurrection? He gave us the most valuable gift of all, forgiveness. Man, do you know that you're forgiven? Do you know that, 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 that God washes you clean? Forgiveness of our sin, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. That word lavish just means overabundance, way more than you ever imagined, way more than you ever need. God just lavishes his grace upon us, but he doesn't stop there. He redeems our mind by giving us wisdom. He redeems our consciousness by giving us insight, by making known to us the mystery of his will. That means he's closer than a friend, closer than a brother. He walks with me and he talks with me. He tells me that I'm his own. He will redeem your getting up. He'll redeem your laying down. And at the right time, in the fullness of time, he will come again to redeem the heavens, to redeem all things on the earth and put them all back together again. Yes, God the Father chose you and when you walked away, Jesus the Son redeemed you. Your name is no longer lost person or broken person. Your name now, Paul says, is the praise of his glory. That's who you are. That's your true identity. You are uniquely blessed, uniquely chosen, and you are uniquely redeemed. He's not finished. Because he gets to piece of the puzzle number four. You are uniquely sealed. That's a good word. I love that word. Uniquely sealed. Verse 13. He says, in him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. That, that, that means the stamp of God is on you. The seal of God is on you. You are protected. No one can snatch you out of my hand, Jesus says. How did you get there? You listened, like you're listening right now, to the truth, like you're hearing right now. It's the gospel of your salvation. And how did you respond? You believed. And the instant that you believed, boom, instantly, in the twinkling of an eye, you were sealed in him forever. Where? In him. How? 
The Holy Spirit did it. It's the spirit of promise. And the spirit of promise is the promise. But the spirit of promise also gives the promise that Jesus said, no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. You are sealed, marked, identified. This word actually means tattooed. You are tattooed with the blood of Jesus. You are tattooed with the name of the Most High. And no one will ever, ever, ever be able to undo that seal. And that spirit of promise is a daily abiding presence that gives you the idea of who you are, the reality of who you are, and then gives you a glimpse of your future, a glimpse of heaven every single day. Verse 14 says the the Holy Spirit was given as a pledge, as a down payment, as a foreshadowing, as a confirmation of who you are and where you're going. And nothing, no one can take it from you. You are chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's who you are. It's your true identity. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is my favorite. Because, Paul says, you are uniquely blessed, chosen, redeemed, sealed, and you also are uniquely empowered. Empowered. In verse 16, Paul says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Paul's saying he prays for them. And that's awesome. We pray for each other. Paul's praying for them. But here's the deal. It's odd. It's curious. Because because usually when we pray for somebody, we, we pray for situations that are going on in their life. We pray for them to get well. Pray for... You know, Aunt Faye's hip to uh, go back into place. We, we, we pray for somebody to find a job. We pray for very specific circumstantial things. And there was lots of circumstances going on in all of this group of churches. They were undergoing persecution. They had conflict. They had false teaching. And all this mess going on. But Paul doesn't pray for any of it. What does he pray for? He prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He prays for them to have wisdom and insight so that they would know Christ better. Why does he do that? Because Paul knows that when you are in Christ, the more you know Christ, the deeper you go in Christ, then the more you know about who you are in Christ. And look what he prays next. Verse 18. He prays that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What is he talking about there? That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He's talking about the big reset. This is the key. He prays that the eyes of your heart... Now, now when we think about the heart, we think, oh, you know, that's the center of our feelings and our emotions. We have a tender heart, we have a hard heart, a broken heart. But they didn't think about the heart that way. The heart was your soul and your will and your intentions and your decision making. It's like your whole inner being. That's what he's talking about. I pray that, that the eyes of your soul, the eyes of your entire inner being might be opened. That you would wake up, that the scales would fall off, that you would begin to see the light. And embrace for perhaps the very first time, not who you think God wants you to be, not who you aspire to be someday, not who you wish you could be right now, but who you are at this moment in Christ. Paul says, reset your identity by resetting your reality. Open your eyes. Walk out into the world that God has prepared for you. Realize who he has made you to be and what you now have at your disposal. Look at what he says here. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be opened so that you may know. Know, be certain, you be settled. That you may know what is the hope of his calling, his invitation. How wide his arms are open to you. How broad and how wide and how open his invitation is to you. And how amazing and how certain his plans are for you. And he says, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? His inheritance. What is his inheritance? His inheritance is you. You're the one he died for. You're the one he found. You're the one he brought to himself. His inheritance is you. 
Paul wants to see us to see how glorious it is to be chosen by God, to belong to Him. There is every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. There is kindness and grace and mercy poured out, lavished on us, riches upon riches. Paul says, don't walk away. Don't miss this. You're leaving it all on the table. Why are we? Because we don't know. We didn't know it was for us. We didn't know those gifts and those blessings were for us. We didn't know joy was for us and peace was for us. No, it's who we are. It's our identity. What else does Paul say that we have access to? Verse 19, he says, And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? Oh, yes, in him you are blessed, you are chosen, you are redeemed, you are sealed, but you are uniquely empowered. What kind of power has God given you? The surpassing greatness of his power. It's power, Paul says, in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. It's not your power, it's his power, but it's been given to you. And it's the same power that he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. It's the same power that seated him at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. It's the same power that placed him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. It's the same power that exalted the name of Jesus above every name that is named, not only in in this age, but in the age to come. It's the power that's yours. It's the power that's mine. It's the power that's ours in Christ. It's miracle power. It's healing power. It's the power to stand in your position, power to walk in the calling to which you've been called. It's power to get back up when you fail. It's power to push back against the forces of evil, power to fight for your marriage, to fight for your family, to fight for your children, power to overcome temptation and weakness and opposition and failure and depression, power to love when you don't want to love, grieve with one who's grieving, weep with one who's weeping. Jesus said it himself. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And guess what, folks? The Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now Paul says, wake up to it and walk in it and come alive to it in Christ. Wake up my mind so that I can think like Christ. Wake up my lips so I can speak like Christ. Wake up my emotions so I can feel what Christ feels. Wake up my will so I can want what Christ wants. Wake up my hands and my feet and my body so I can do what Christ does. There is power. There is power. There is wonder working power and it's yours for the asking. It's yours for the taking. It's yours for the using and it's not just what you do. It's who you are. It's your true identity. You are uniquely empowered in Christ. That's something to get excited about. Who am I? In me, I'm just me. I'm flawed. I'm broken. Some days I'm a complete mess. And I'm certainly not what the world tells me I should be. Because I'm not rich. I'm good looking, but I'm not that good looking. <laughs> I don't have influence. I don't have authority. I don't have clout. But I want to tell you something today, that you're not what the world tells you you are either. You're not what the enemy tells you you are. In fact, you're not what you tell yourself you are sometimes. You're not a failure. You're not less than. Your past doesn't define you. Your past doesn't disqualify you. Oh yeah, you may be a hot mess right now. You might be exhausted right now. You might be run down right now. You might be overwhelmed. You might be in some terrible circumstances. You may have done some terrible things. And that may be who you are in you. But that's not who you are in Christ. In Christ, you are a new creation. In Christ, there is no condemnation. In Christ, you have been set free. So today, Right in this moment, you are who Christ says you are. And Christ says you are blessed and you are chosen and you've been redeemed and you've been sealed and now you've been empowered. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're chosen to be holy and blameless, to belong to God and be protected by heaven. You're his child. His name is on your birth certificate. You have been uniquely redeemed, forgiven, 
washed clean. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Nobody can take that away from you. And it reminds you daily who you are and where you're going. And you're uniquely empowered. You are more than a conqueror. You are more than an overcomer. And this is where we need to start because this is what we need to hear right now in this season. That you're not what your circumstances say that you are. You're not what Instagram says you are. You are who Christ says you are. And as we get through this, this, this letter, we're going we're gonna to reset a lot of things along the way. And we need to. But today it all starts when we realize who we are in Christ. Reset your identity right now today. Don't believe the lies the world has fed you. Don't believe the mess that the enemy's given you. Don't believe what you sometimes tell yourself. Step into your new creation. Step into freedom. Step into your identity in Christ. Let's stand.